Okay, we are just opening up our session here today. Hello and welcome. Um, as you can see on your screen, you've reached the University of Cambridge Judge Business School uh, informational session on the upcoming program entitled Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, uh, DEI Strategies for Business Impact. Uh, today's program informational webinar is going to take us through two key elements of this program here today. Uh, firstly, we're going to be learning all about this program's content. So what is the curriculum? What can you expect to learn? Uh, what are those learning objectives here in the program? And how are they going to help you uh, apply these themes and concepts in your workplace environment? Um, and in your life. Uh, so we're going to be learning about that content. Uh, the second element is how you'll be learning. So we're going to be talking about the learning experience, uh, the ways in which this program is designed to ensure that you have the very best uh, learning experience possible. So a lot in store as we make our way through this next hour together. Um, but first and foremost, uh, we want to be able to highlight uh, the reciprocal nature of this program, the ways in which are the driver of your own learning experience. And so one of the things we're hoping you'll be able to do here today, um, but we're also going to save time at the end, about 10 to 15 minutes to really dive into your questions and get them answered by, by today's keynote um, subject matter expert, who I'll be introducing here in just a moment. Uh, so as we make our way through the session, um, but let's go ahead and dive into the content here today. We've got a lot to cover. I'm going to introduce today's keynote speaker here in just a moment. Uh, from there, we'll talk about this broader community that you're joining here at Cambridge Judge Business School. What can you expect uh, from this, this learning experience here at Cambridge Judge? Uh, you'll learn about some of your program faculty and guest contributors uh, that have sort of put their minds together to develop this comprehensive program here. Uh, we're going to talk about your learning outcomes, those module details. What are you going to be um, discovering from week to week? What are you going to be learning more about? Uh, you, we'll talk about assessment in the program. We'll talk about case study tools and frameworks. Um, we're also going to talk about next steps with admissions. And then finally, as promised there, we're going to get to all of your questions. Um, that's one of the things that really sets this program apart. Um, the learning experiences in and of itself, you have a peer a cohort that is truly diverse across geographies, also diverse across industry areas years of work experience, job function, and professional role. So as you think about your cohort in this program, uh, you're, you're truly going to be learning from uh, many different voices. You're going to get that tapestry of ideas um, as you learn shoulder to shoulder with a global network of peers. Uh, so a lot in store here for you in the program and certainly here today. Uh, so thank you for introducing yourselves. Let's dive right in. Uh, I'd love to introduce today's star of the show. The other star besides all of you who's here with us is your program faculty, um, we have Professor Lionel uh, Peolela here with us, who's an associate professor in strategy and organization. Uh, professor uh, Peolela, uh, would you like to jump in and greet the audience here today? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. I'm here in Cambridge right now, uh, 1 p.m. Thank you so much, Mary, for uh, organizing this. Again, welcome to this webinar, wherever you are in the part of the world. And uh, we're going to Hope keep it short and interesting for you. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Professor Paolela, for being here with us today. I'm going to turn that spotlight over to him here in just a moment uh, to take us through the details of this program. Uh, but quickly, let's move through some of the context setting slides here. We want you to have a good understanding of this community that you're joining. Um, as many of you know, a Cambridge judge um, has really forged a reputation in its field for rigorous thinking and high impact transformative education. Uh, so this program is designed to be transformative, uh, to really um, attract uh, thought leaders from across the globe, innovators, creative thinkers, uh, problem solvers, uh, to come together and really uh, leave a mark on the world. So really learn shoulder to shoulder, uh, drawing from a huge diversity of backgrounds and countries uh, uh, to advance knowledge and leadership across the globe. And so that's what we're hoping to do here in this program. That's how we've designed this program. Uh, we've designed this program for managers and executives who understand the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace um, and want to gain some actionable insights frameworks, methodologies, um, in order to employ these strategies in your work environment and in your organization. And so that's what this program is going to help you to be able to do. Um, spearheading this program, of course, you have Professor Lionel uh, Pei Olela, who is an associate professor in strategy and organization. But more than that, uh, you can see here on his bio, um, a lot of information about his background, his research before joining at uh, the University of Cambridge. He was a visiting scholar at the University of Chicago, um, as well as Columbia University. So he's, he's uh, traveled uh, and has been uh, uh, 
talking about these themes in, in a variety of different settings and contexts. Um, you'll see many of them listed here in his bio. Um, his main line of research explores how market categories, a set of firms that share cognitive and cultural similarities, um, affect the social evaluation and performance of organizations and how to foster diversity, equity, and inclusion in organizations. So that's the, the linchpin, the central uh, research focus here uh, that Professor uh, Paolella is bringing to this program and bringing to the curriculum. Um, he's joined by a variety of colleagues who have brought in their expert uh, knowledge and research into this program as well. Uh, Patricia Vecchi is the assistant professor in organizational behavior. Uh, she, she thinks about and researches topics uh, related to negotiation, power, politics, social networks, how to lead change. Um, she works with a program uh, that's centered around the unique challenges that women face as they rise as leaders in organizations. So she's thinking about a diversity in a variety of different contexts there as well. Um, so she's bringing in her, uh, her background, her research. Um, she's helping leaders to have an impact on their organizations uh, throughout the globe here. And we encourage you to come back and take a more detailed look um, at the bio details of your two course faculty here um, that, we've, that we've provided. Uh, we're gonna be sharing out all of the slides here today with each and every one of you. So in addition to recording today's session, uh, we're gonna be following up in about a day or two uh, to provide you copies of that recording as well as all of the slides. Uh, so come back and take a more detailed look um, at some of the background and interests of your program faculty. Uh, they are joined also by David Stidwell, who's a professor of computational social science, as well as the academic director of the Psychometric Center. Um, so bringing in his research on social media data uh, from millions of consenting individuals to show how uh, computers can predict a user's personality and accurately, as accurately as their spouse can. Uh, so a lot of, of interest there in exploring uh, together with David Stilwell. Um, his research has, has been cited in a variety of uh, government um, uh, by many governments, national data protection regulators worldwide. Um, he consults on topics related to psychometrics, people analytics, and big data. Uh, they are joined by featured guest speakers. So all throughout the program, again, as we think about diversity, we're thinking about diversity of thought as well, and we're drawing on expert voices. I'm going to showcase some of them for you here. I'm not going to go through uh, line by line here, but certainly um, as you think about the industry speakers, the guest speakers, your program faculty, um, this is truly a collaborative effort here at the University of Cambridge judge to pull together um, all of these voices um, and bring those themes and concepts into the curriculum here. So you're going to be hearing from a variety of thought leaders here at Cambridge Judge. Um, throughout your time in the program, this is a six-week program. Uh, we estimate four to six hours per week be devoted to the program, and most of those hours are yours to design. So you're going to be looking ahead at your schedule, uh, and you're going to select the four to six hours that work best for you from week to week. So at the beginning of each week, a set of content is released that contains videos, expert voices, assignments, exercises, dis discussion threads. That's all really least at the beginning of the week, and then you have an entire seven days uh, to make your way through that material, much of which is asynchronous, which allows you that opportunity to design a schedule that works for you. Uh, so we have a program here that's a nice blend of asynchronous, giving you that convenience of a flexible schedule, as well as synchronous components, um, giving you those live interaction opportunities and those chances to build relationships and stay engaged. So if you think about the two words that describe the learning experience, um, it's convenient and interactive. Uh, so throughout your time in the program, there are live webinars that you'll have an opportunity to participate in where you'll engage with your course faculty, you'll engage with your peers, uh, you'll learn directly from one another um, throughout your time in the program. At the beginning of each week, uh, you'll do goal setting. So you'll take a look at that module. You'll understand uh, some of those overarching learning objectives, and you'll set those individual goals, really being the driver of your own learning experience as you make your way through the program. Uh, you'll see a few other components here. Uh, there are question and answer sessions. So in addition to those live webinars, you have office hours with program leaders. Uh, program leaders are sort of like teaching fellows. So you have your program faculty, you have industry experts, guest voices, all brought into the curriculum, and then you of program leaders at the helm of that day-to-day -day learning experience. Uh, your program leaders are industry experts who have been asked to come into this program and serve as your day-to-day -day teaching fellows and guides. Um, they host question sessions. Again, a chance for you to turn on your audio, turn on your video, 
network, build relationships, and get to know one another, um, as well as get your questions answered. So you have those live learning opportunities peppered throughout uh, your time here in the program. A uh, lot of uh, program support. You have uh, 24-7 um, access to support anytime that you need it. You'll have an entire week at the beginning of this program called Orientation Week, uh, where you'll get to know your peers. You'll build your profile. You'll get to know uh, the learning management system that we use to deliver this program. And you'll certainly have uh, that full syllabus that you can take a look at as well. So you have an entire week for orientation and then an entire year uh, to take a look at that material. So even though it's a six-week program, you have access to that dashboard for an entire year where you'll be able to go back in, take a look at the material, the readings, the discussion threads, and continue engaging with your colleagues. Um, there are assignments throughout. All of the assignments, as you'll see here today, are geared towards helping you to bring these concepts into a place of action in real time in your organization. Organization. Uh, so you'll see that here today, um, a lot of opportunity for you to review and reflect and discuss your learning uh, with your program faculty, your program leaders, and your peers throughout. Uh, so with that, I am now going to stop speaking and hand over the spotlight uh, to today's uh, subject matter expert and keynote star of the show here, Lionel uh, Pei Olela. Uh, very glad to have you here with us today. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. I'll be back in uh, here a little bit later on in the session to help moderate questions. Um, but with that, I warmly invite into the spotlight at today's program faculty. Thanks again for being here with us. Thank you so much, uh, Mary, for this uh, induction. So my role is to give you uh, an overview of this program, the six different modules and the key features, the key aspect of this program. So first, why this program? You know, And you all know this already, movement like Black Lives Matter or Me Too, they have pushed at the forefront of business agenda, the issue of diversity, equity, and uh, inclusion. If you are here today, it's that you are already interested in this and that many, and you know that many organizations want to do the right thing, want to set up the right initiatives. They want to increase their commitment of diversity, equity, and inclusion. However, what we see on Perkley is that a true DEI, commitment, a true DI strategy, an effective strategy. It's not just a collection of disparate initiatives that we still see in many organizations, because sometimes they are inconsistent, they are not clear, uh, not implemented uh, well, but you do need to develop a clear strategy. And an effective and consistent DI strategies have become more and more crucial to uh, thrive in the current environment. So this program, it's here to help you to design this DEI strategy in a consistent way and aligned with the specific culture and context of your organization. This program blends some theory and some uh, practical insight from our guest speakers and uh, expert voices, and also uh, academic knowledge at the cutting edge, forefront academic knowledge, which I'm going to develop what I call diversity V1, V2, and even uh, V3. But the key message that I just want to highlight is again, if you are here, is that you are interested in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And of course, we designed the program for people who will sign up, but we also designed the program for people who won't sign up, meaning that you need to be an ambassador of DEI and you need to broaden the scope and the, the target of people that you will reach to really infuse DEI within your organization. That's the key message that if we want to succeed in DEI results, DEI targets, objectives, we should broaden the scope of initiatives, of the broaden the scope of audience to really reach out to the majority, which is still the main majority in organization to really move the needle. And I always, I'm gonna start like this because I always have the question, Okay, so DEI program seems, like, seems good, but why are you the leading faculty? You know, someone, a male, white, from an elite institution, not part of the LGBTQIA plus community, but that's exactly the point. If, we, if you want to be serious about DEI within your organizational context, you should involve and bring everyone on board. You should really involve each of your colleagues in the DEI initiatives to really, again, achieve your successful 
strategy. And again, don't worry, I'm not the only one. As Mary mentioned, there are many, many uh, contributing faculty, uh, my great colleagues, Patricia and David, and also some guest speakers from very different experiences, very different uh, industries and positions. <clears throat> so just to dive a bit uh, deeper into the program, can we go to the next slide, please? So what are the learning outcomes? Again, this program features a diverse perspective for a diverse topic, both from the academic knowledge and the uh, industry uh, experts, including my colleagues uh, at the faculty level, but also some uh, uh, industry uh, practitioners to have a holistic view of diversity and to really try to tackle and to address all characteristics of diversity in terms of race and gender, of course, in terms of ethnicity background, but also in terms of social class, in terms of age, in terms of disability, uh, in terms of cultural differences. Right now, you know, as you can hear from my uh, terrific strong French accent, I'm not a native speaker in English. And that uh, infuses some biases in your assessment to what I'm saying, okay? Accent is one characteristic that you should take into account in your diversity policies. So we're gonna to try to, again, to broaden the scope in terms of audience, try to engage with the majority, but also in terms of topics to really cover and to, have, to adopt a comprehensive view of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So hopefully by the end of this program, you will be able to demonstrate a business case for diversity. I will detail, it's quite well known, but now we have, causal relationship to show that you have a diversity premium. And I insist on the word demonstrate because again, if you are here, most of you are already convinced by this, the importance of this topic, but you will learn new knowledge, but your role again is to be an ambassador and to convince people that are a bit reluctant or they don't have time or that's not their main occupation or uh, worry, their main focus the diversity, equity, inclusion policies in your organization. So you need to show them, to demonstrate them the business case, to recognize the individual and organizational factors that lead to discrimination. So of course the unconscious biases, but more at the systemic and structural level. What are the procedures, the systems within your organization that, uh, that can create some discrimination? to develop a plan to diversify your workforce, what are the micro-level strategies to adopt, the micro-practices, and more the micro-level uh, initiatives at the organizational level. So the, the two layers, very important. Identify ways to implement. So we're going to spend two modules on implementation. That's very important. And again, to engage with everybody within your firm and to construct a communication strategy for your DEI policies, that's through the capstone project and the assignment that I will, uh, I will develop. So again, to be a, a bit more detailed, what's the syllabus look like of this program? You have six modules. So one, uh, just to define diversity, and I will dive deeper into each module um, in the next slides. Then the cause of discrimination, both at the micro level and macro level how to diversify your workforce, the traditional knowledge about how to attract a diverse pool of applicants, how to recruit, to promote, to evaluate people, how to uh, use data, okay? As we say, data is a new oil, how to, to drive your DI strategy by data, very important. How to increase uh, the organizational incentives, the organizational factors to foster a uh, uh, diverse workplace, and then how to implement and design, to design and implement all these DI policies that you want to, uh, to push within your organization. So the first module is just to set up the stage and to be on the same floor, the same stage for everybody. What is diversity and why should we care about diversity? So we should, we will define um, precisely the different concepts, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and why are the three very important, and what are the links, how, to what extent they are related. 
Uh, do you, would you prefer or should you favor diversity, equity, or inclusion, or should you try to adopt the three at the same time? I will try to make the case that you should push for the three concepts at the same time. Again, why should we care about diversity? Um, that's a well-known, I mean, classical traditional topic, but with new academic knowledge, with new academic evidence to make the case and to convince, again, to engage with the majority within your organization that they won't take, they won't attend this course, or they don't pay uh, so much attention to diversity, equity, and inclusion. If you want, again, to have a huge impact, you shouldn't speak with people that agree with, with you or that in charge with DI, but everybody in any levels of the hierarchy within the firm, any title should have a DI component in the job. And that's very important to convince them about the importance of uh, DEI. We're going to rely a lot on many examples, many stories, case studies to see what worked and why di what didn't work in the past and what are the lessons that we can learn from those cases. And as much as possible, we're going to try to tailor all this knowledge to your specific organization. And that's very good that you're a very diverse audience from very different countries, very different industries, because one mentioned in the chat that she's working from IKEA, I think. What will work at IKEA won't work for Cambridge Judge Business School, for example. Okay. And why? To, so try to explain the key variables, the key underlying mechanisms, and really try to tailor, to customize the knowledge learned in those six modules to your organization. Mm, what can I add? Why we should care about diversity, but when should we care about diversity? For example, that's a bit novel in uh, academic uh, literature that when diversity is the most important to achieve, actually it's the most important in uncertainty, uh, uncertain and unstable environment, like today in a disruption world. That's where you have a, a premium in terms of diversity, for example. So I will show you some academic articles, case studies, to really refine this uh, diversity premium idea. So the second slide is about individual and organizational causes of discrimination, meaning exploring the cognitive and behavioral biases, what you, you know as unconscious uh, biases, but also the five major organizational practices that hinder diversity and the three myths, myths that perpetuate this discrimination. So module one and module two, that's what I call diversity V1. Why diversity? Why should we care? And why do we all discriminate? No matter your political beliefs, your religious beliefs, your demographic characteristics, we will all discriminate because of unconscious biases. So that's again, a great case to make to bring everyone on board. But also we discriminate because of the processes in place within your organization, some organizational factors like your hiring practices, your promotion practices, the way you evaluate people. Do you evaluate people at the individual level or more at the team level? Most of the time it's at the individual level. Why, why is that? Why do we have all this belief? <clears throat> Should you adopt teamwork and team uh, team evaluation process, but you have the, also the three wider and opportunistic behavior. So how to balance those two? The role allocation, the task assignment, great study showing that, you know, we think that uh, female employees, for example, there is this belief that female employees are better in, in terms of communication. Well, it's because we assign them those tasks that reinforce our biases and perceived conceptions. Okay, so how do you allocate the, the task? The, 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 how do you divide the labor within your organization? That it's an organizational factor that will reinforce or perpetuate some uh, discrimination. The role of compensation as well. Are you transparent in your compensation in your salary scale? Do you, re do you have a, a, a merit-based uh, pay? a merit-based comp compensation system? Should you have a merit-based compensation system? If yes, how do you implement that? Because you can create 
uh, discrimination. So you should create transparency and accountability. <clears throat> and also the structure of your organization, how is it uh, structure in terms of culture, in terms of hierarchies. And we're gonna discuss in detail uh, one of the main criterion actually to hire people is the, what we call the culture fit. And why is it useful, but also very dangerous to rely on culture fit? Because most of the time, uh, culture fit overlaps with some cultural differences, which overlaps with uh, social background differences. And culture fit leads to discrimination in terms of social classes that of course you will hire more easily someone very similar to you. So why do you do that? How can you stop uh, this uh, vicious circle? What are the main barriers to uh, overcome, to avoid the pitfall of, uh, of culture fit? That's uh, what I wanted to mention for V1 and V2, uh, for module one and module two. That's the diversity V1, you know, the basic, uh, but still needed with uh, uh, more knowledge and insight from uh, practitioners about diversity V1. Why does it matter? What are the unconscious biases and the organizational barriers? Then we have module three and four. So module three, what I call diversity V2. Module three is <clears throat> learn how to craft, to design and implement the right practices at the micro level. So very, we were gonna to try to be very precise. How do you interview people? How do you, uh, um, how do you write? And how do you advertise your job positions to try to attract a broader and more diverse pool of applicants? How do you design your evaluation um, performance sheet, your performance scores within your firm? All these micro level practices you should pay a lot of attention because there are very, very uh, insidious and minor initiatives that have a huge effect on discrimination and on a lower level of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we're gonna look at the entire, the wolf hiring funnel from attraction to the final offer and see how can you improve your process based on example like Yelp, the writing company in the tech industry, uh, Google example as well, they make small changes, very minor and small changes, but with a huge impact. So we're gonna discuss all the micro scale challenges, but also the remedies, the opportunities to foster diversity and inclusion within your, uh, within your organization. What are the remedies how to overcome your um, stereotypical judgment, how to improve the appraisal of performance of your colleagues, of your worker. So module four is about why data should drive your DI strategy. So that's more, more advanced knowledge and techniques in terms of diversity. <clears throat> that's what I call the diversity V3, you know, V1 again, it's why diversity matter uh, and what are the role of unconscious biases. Diversity V2 is what can we do that you already do in terms of attraction, recruitment, promotion process, having a diversity directors, diversity task force, this kind of thing, diversity training. And right now, module four, five, six, it's really about diversity uh, V3, the cutting edge knowledge in terms of academic uh, literature, and also uh, our experts in uh, different industries. So the key thing is how do you use data to drive your DI strategy? Should data drive your DI strategy? And if so, how to implement a data-driven strategy? For example, again, Google, they had a, a very finer grain level of data to see that they didn't have really a, a gender pay gap, but it was more a motherhood pay gap and even more a parenthood pay gap. So how do you respond to a motherhood or parenthood penalty in terms of career advancement and in terms of um, compensation, okay? Should, would you make any difference between female employees and male employees in terms of uh, uh, parental leave, for example? 
I will argue you shouldn't, and we're going to see why, and the evidence-based uh, policies that what worked, what didn't work again. So based on data with my colleague David Stilwell, who is an expert in uh, computational science and big data, and he will show you, again, with small implementation at, the lowest, at a very finer grain level, but implemented at a large scale at the firm level, how do you uh, collect data, to track the data, to avoid to include the biases, to foster diversity, equity, inclusion. I will give you a great example about some firms or even the uh, SAT exam in the US. If you're from the US, you know that to enter in the, the college system, um, that they have changed their evaluation process and how to collect data and track uh, the, the quality of students to avoid some gender differences and gender discrimination. So the way you collect data, the way you track data, and you, the way you leverage data are key milestone, key steps in your DEI, um, in your DEI strategy. And we're going to have the, the, an interview with a Matthew Corritor from a startup in the US, who is an expert in designing uh, processes and testing to see what work and what don't work. So most of the time, in my experience, based on organizations that I'm working with, they try to implement diversity initiatives, like a mentoring program, for example, let's take mentoring program, but without testing it, without, without assessing the effect of this mentoring program. So you should adopt an A-B testing strategy that some of your employees, they have access to this mentor program, others, they don't have access to this mentoring program. And after six months, you see the, you see the impact of this program on some outcomes, and you see the differences between two groups. How do you implement and leverage this A-B testing uh, methods? That's where, what we're going to see in module four. And that really changes the landscape of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, practices. So module five, it's all the initiatives, not at the micro level, what we have discussed in module three, but more at the macro level. Okay, so diversity training, would you do diversity training? Yes, you should, but not alone. It's just a way to set up the agenda and to put at the forefront of your organization, the DI topic, diversity training, for example. But what are the good practices uh, to implement within your firm to foster and uh, to increase the engagement of people, the contact, and the accountability. That's the three key word. That's the ACE framework that I will develop, accountability, contact, and engagement. What are the best practices uh, to implement within your firm to increase those three characteristics? And again, based on evidence and on a longitudinal study in the, in the US across 800 firms over 50 years, where we are able to assess what work and what doesn't work and why, and how to tailor these initiatives to your specific context, to your specific uh, organization. And very important, the second part of this uh, module is also how to avoid the common pitfall to help ensuring the success of diversity initiative. And that's based on, uh, on, uh, on my research that I will mention also a bit later is, why are we still struggling about DEI despite the fact that we put a lot of effort and that we are very serious? Organization, you know, some organizations, they are still in a social washing uh, type of thing, but most of the organization, they are very serious and they are still struggling. Why? Because it's not a systematic approach. So we're going to develop that because it's not data driven, as I mentioned in module four, but also because you have unintended negative consequences. And you can have backlash effect, okay? That's based on my research, for example, in a law firm context, when they increase organization at the top, the gender diversity at the top, they are, likely, they are less likely to hire junior female associates at the first year level. And again, that's more unintended 
negative spillover. That's an adverse effect. It was not intended, but why, why does it happen? And what are the remedies? Okay, so we're going to discuss a lot those pitfalls, this, those adverse effects that could undermine the efficiency, the effectiveness of your DEI uh, strategy. Why do you have an implicit quota at the top of the organization? For example, if you look uh, the, the, the firms based on the Fortune 500 or the S&P uh, 500 companies, most of them have two women uh, in their board, two women in their board, uh, two women appointed as board members. And why only two? Why two, for example? And why then you have a, an implicit quota to achieve three, four, or five other positions for uh, uh, female directors? Okay, so this kind of uh, negative adverse effect that are very important today. Um, that's the new trend in our academic knowledge and our work with, uh, in our consulting and work with companies to understand and to avoid these unintended negative consequences of your DI policies. And to make uh, the connection and to continue on building up on this point, we're gonna discuss in module six, how to, uh, uh, the next slide, module six, how to bring everyone on board when you design and implement your strategy in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. How to design, communicate, and implement a DI strategy, avoiding some backlash effect, avoiding some resistance from the majority. So it could be passive resistance. We are all too busy. We are all receiving too many emails. And you asking me as a product manager, for example, as a faculty member, as I don't know, uh, any, any position, you're asking me to add one dimension to my job, which I'm already uh, full uh, and I don't have the capacity. How do you convince people to bring, to, 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 to bring this DEI block into their daily job? Okay? How do you build a life that's very, very important in your both in your formulation and also execution in your DEI strategy. What we see still today, I would say, is that DEI is too siloed in companies. You have a DEI manager, a DEI uh, diversity committee, you have um, <clears throat> a DEI task force, but it doesn't, those, all those initiatives that don't infuse uh, within the rest of the organization. So again, how do you bring everyone on board? And how do you make sure that everybody is on the same page and with this DI element on their uh, daily task? So in this last module, you're gonna assess your current DI strategy to try to see some gaps and future avenues of uh, improvement. How to employ an effective communication strategies to articulate the business case for DI within your organization and to come up with a a full comprehensive plan that you can implement at the end of your program uh, within your organization. <clears throat> so again, we're gonna focus on how to bring everyone on board, how to bring everyone uh, on board for uh, the LGBTQIA plus community, for example, when you're not part of this community, how can, you, how can you sensitize your workers, your employees, your colleagues to this, uh, to the difficulties that, the, that those people might share about the, the disability. How do you make your uh, organization much more uh, disabled people friendly? And how do you mitigate the unintended negative, negative consequences, which is the passive or active resistance of the majority? For example, would you, should you create role models? Should you rely on role models? We're gonna see that there are some advantages, disadvantages, and how to really implement a role model, how to create role models within your organization. How do you provide sponsorship? Okay. How to be a good ally? Again, my dream is that in your organization, everybody should care about DEI, especially when you are like me, a male, white, uh, from a, a elite background and without 
being part of uh, the, the LGBTQIA plus community. How do you engage with the majority within your organization or people that are not directly benefiting from those initiatives? How to become a good ally, okay? Allyship, it's very difficult. It's a bit like leading with permission. You should stand behind the individual that need those uh, policies. You should stand beside sometimes, or sometimes you should stand in front and to be really the, the speaker and the representative of some people that are uh, disadvantaged. So how to combine the three aspects of uh, allyship, for example, we're gonna discuss that again to avoid the common pitfalls um, to ensure the success of your DEI strategy. I'm going to speed up because I really want to leave time for the question. Just to illustrate that we're going to rely on many examples, many case studies like Yelp, Shell, Google, uh, GSK Pharmaceutical Company, Upspot, Goldman Sachs, or even in a public uh, organization like the SAT exam. So we try to design uh, as many examples as possible, but as diverse as, as, diverse as possible across very different industries, very different, different regions of the world, very different hierarchical levels, and small firms, big firms, startups, very old traditional sector, a diverse uh, set of examples. Can we move on, please? The frameworks and tools. So how to assess your unconscious bias for people who don't know already, what I call the S framework, how do you increase accountability, contact, and engagement. That's the three key words of a good DEI strategy. Accountability, contact between the diverse uh, background of people, and engagement. How do you make everyone engaged uh, toward diversity practices? How do you stand as an ally? How to be a good uh, ally? How do you provide effective sponsorship? Sometimes it can be har harmful sponsorship or mentorship. Most of the time it can be very successful, but how do you implement those classical uh, tools, but in the right way? And how to be an active bystander if you witness something inappropriate, how do you react? Okay, because you are also scared for your own position, your own job, but what you have witnessed, it's unacceptable. How to you, how to raise this issue within your firm to be, uh, to be the most, um, efficient for you and for your organization, the most useful for the individuals at stake for yourself and for the organization. Last uh, slide for my own. It's about the assignment and capstone project. Again, what we tried um, is to design some assignments that will be very helpful for you in, uh, after the program, in your daily job, in your daily life. So each time, after each module, you will have one block of your DI strategy to develop, to assess your DI initiative in your organizations. What are the individuals and organizational barriers? What are the practices in place currently? What are the data that you collect, that you track? How do you collect them? Okay. What are the uh, rooms of improvement? And then how to apply that? What's your implementation strategy? So each, for each module, you will have one block, hopefully, of your DI strategy. That's how we design the, um, the capstone project and the assessment for this course. And I think I'm done. I'm too long. Sorry. Thank you very much. I hope uh, it was useful to dig deeper into this program. And I will pass over to my colleague, uh, Mauro. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Paolela, for being here, taking us through these themes and concepts, um, how DEI winning communication strategies differ from any other kind of communication strategy. It's a great question. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and talk some more about uh, what that learning experience is like, and then we're going to open up for questions here in just a moment. Um, but firstly, as you can see, um, each week you have uh, bite-sized video lectures. These are on demand. You'll be able to watch them in your own time as many times as you need to really gain a good understanding of those frameworks and then you're going to step away from those frameworks that you learned in these bite-sized videos and really tinker with those learnings in a fully immersive environment so roll up your sleeves um, take your learnings from our faculty here 
and take part in a variety of assignments, case study analogies, really seeing how DEI strategies have been implemented and employed um, in organizations across the globe through case study analyses, really looking at those frameworks, taking place, uh, taking part in assignments uh, really geared towards helping you to bring to life your knowledge, a cutting edge learning platform uh, that you have access to on the go. So you'll be able to access all of your material on your tablet, on your mobile device, um, videos, all of that is accessible through our app. So a lot of opportunity here for you to engage live with faculty, engage live with program leaders, um, and then take part in this immersive environment. Um, we like to think of the space that we've created here as uh, breaking down some of the barriers in space and in time that you typically see in a traditional classroom where there's only a certain number of seats in the room, certain amount of minutes to get through a certain set of content. Uh, here in this online environment, we can break down those barriers of space and time and really develop a program that's fully immersive, learn as you go at your own pace around a schedule that works for you and doing so in a way that's still highly interactive where you're engaging with your program leaders, with your faculty and with your peers. So it's truly a remarkable opportunity as you think about um, next steps in your educational journey. Is this really the right program for you? If you are looking for a program that's highly engaging, interactive, active, um, convenient, um, that allows you to really build your learning into your full-time role. Uh, that is what you're going to find here in this program. A lot of different layers of support all working towards a credential here from Cambridge Judge. Uh, so if you're interested in springboarding into some career advancement opportunities, if you're a mid-level manager and you're looking to uh, take on more leadership roles within your organization, certainly having a certificate here uh, that showcases your knowledge and diversity, equity, and inclusion is going to go a long way in helping you to uh, springboard into some of those career goals. So uh, certainly uh, gaining a, a, cer a certificate, uh, you know, a way to formalize your training here and showcase your learning um, is a huge asset to the program in addition to those uh, peer networks that you've had a chance to build throughout your time in the program. Uh, this is our last and final slide. I'm going to open it up for questions now. I know many of you have uh, some great questions. We want to get through as many of them as we can. Uh, but firstly, I want to point your attention to this link here. It's going to take you right over to the course enrollment page. Um, once you're on the course enrollment page, you'll be able to click the apply now button, put in your contact details, your name and your email address, and then you'll be able to do two things from there. Uh, firstly, you can download the full course brochure, and that covers all of the curriculum that we've described here today, the learning experience, and more. Uh, so if you really want to deep dive into this program, download that course brochure, take a look at it. Uh, the second thing you'll be able to do using that link there in the chat, uh, click on that Apply Now button, put in your contact details. You'll also be able to schedule an appointment with an academic advisor. So we have here with us on the call live today four academic advisors. In fact, if you put a question into the question and you box and you You've gotten a response via type text. Uh, that was one of our advisors here supporting the session. Um, they know the most about the logistics for the program, the dates, the times, the schedules, the policies, um, what's the uh, evaluative criteria for earning that certificate of completion. Uh, they're closest to those details. And certainly the registration and enrollment process, getting your application uh, materials together on time and submitted, um, financing options if you're interested in exploring, flexible payment options, special group enrollment pricing, all of that, your academic academic advisors will be able to assist you with. Uh, so be sure to pick up that link there in your chat, download the course brochure, schedule an appointment. We use Calendly, so you'll be able to select a time that works for you right there uh, within the website uh, to get connected with an advisor. They're going to be able to help with next steps as you prepare to begin the program. We want to make sure that that high level of support and relationship building starts right here, right now with getting you connected with an advisor. Um, if you're not quite ready to go to the website, we've also got an email address there for you. That's cambridge at emeritus.org. You'll see that there in the chat as well. You can also email us and we'll get you connected uh, with a mentor uh, to help support you as you prepare to begin this program. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and open up to questions. Uh, this is perhaps uh, the most fun that we'll have, the most interactive part of our time here together is where we get a chance to hear what's on your mind. Uh, so Professor uh, Pio, Lella, if I can invite you back into the, the frame here, uh, maybe we can start making yeah. our way through the queue. I see Jen's question came in, the, the distinction between equality and equity. Can you talk more mm -hmm. about some of the, the terminology there? So yeah, I do make a, a difference, personal difference, but for me, e equality is the outcome, is your goal, is your target, okay? And sometimes to reach equality, you need to be unequal because we don't start with the same background. So you need to help a bit more some people with a, a, a underprivileged background, with a disadvantaged situation to reach this equality. So equity is more the process 
to reach the outcome equality. So that's why, I, personally, I, I prefer to talk about equity, about the process to really reach uh, equality. Uh, then we no, have the I'm question so of, uh, sorry, please, Mary. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to, I, well, I'm sorry for the delay in jumping in here, but there's sort of a two-part question that Simona asked, and I want to raise this one. Uh, so she yeah. talked about communication strategies on DEI and how that differs from just regular communication strategy. And then she also said, what about DEI systems or strategies from the past? You know, you talked about, particularly in the last module, you know, forming a coalition of support, getting other people on board. What if there's, you know, really with any organization, there is a DEI strategy, whether we're focusing on it or not, DEI is impacting every organization. So how do you deal uh, with predetermined cultures, predetermined strategies that you might need to disentangle from? So for me, the, the two questions are, are related and one I will uh, treat in the live webinars because we can't cover everything in the online content. So the, the second question about adverse legacy, we're going to discuss that a lot in detail during the live webinar. But so do, do we, can we make a difference between any communication uh, successful communication strategy and DEI communication. Yeah, I would say so because DEI communication is even more difficult because you are always challenged by people who are not beneficiaries of those initiatives, who agree, but passively, they don't change uh, at all their behavior. So that's why it's even more difficult. You need to, to go to the extra mile to really uh, uh, succeed in bringing everyone on board. And the worst case scenario, it's what one that you meant is the, the legacy context. And we have a great paper showing that history of past aggression actually increase discrimination in organizations. So when you have a, a firm with a, a, a past aggressions of, uh, in, the, in that case of, of uh, female employees, it's even worse afterwards. Afterwards, why? Because they just adopted the scapegoating strategy. They didn't really change anything. So we're going to discuss that, uh, where the communication is even more important. The data is even more important to make your point, to challenge this uh, legacy, uh, and to really turn around, uh, transform the culture of your company. So we're going to discuss that in the in the live webinar at the end. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Paolella. I know we're, we're running a little bit short on time, so I wanted to kind of bump through some more of these questions here. Uh, get connected with an advisor, and they're going to be able to help point you to those testimonials and, and some of the background in the design of this program. So certainly that's a great one for your, uh, for your uh, advisor. Uh, a question here, and maybe this will be our final one here. Um, had us uh, the question about technology. I think we did cover that. Uh, you, this question came in earlier. We talked about some of those tools and technologies. Your advisor can go a little bit deeper if you're interested in exploring those further. Um, but the question here from Mia um, about this area of work in, in belonging, um, it also, uh, it, yeah, I'm going to combine that with uh, Viliat's question from the chat about intercultural awareness and how that fits in. So as you're thinking about really establishing a culture of belonging that incorporates intercultural awareness, um, you know, is this something that is, is going to be involved like in the strategies that we talk about in this program are we going to be talking about this sense of belonging and cultural awareness yeah so we're going to discuss that more in the uh, later part of the of the modules i i still use uh inclu inclusion but more and more as you said the term of uh, belonging and well-being of your uh, employees mental health again we're going to mention that specifically in a live webinar so we we mentioned that more at the implementation stage of your uh, strategy, of your DI strategy. And just to finish, uh, I've noticed on the point, uh, an example of my own terminology, diversity V1, V2, V3. What I call diversity V1 20 years ago is why diversity matters and why do we have unconscious biases? That's very well known now. Diversity mm -hmm. V2 is we are more and more serious about diversity initiative policies, but still inconsistent and disparate. For example, you don't track, you don't have a good uh, data uh, management system. And what I call diversity v V3 is really to take care in terms of data and in terms of implementation to, av to avoid this adverse effect and to really increase uh, the, the allyship and to get the buy-in of the majority within your company. That's the key thing, diversity, now we are clear about what work, what don't work, 
But how do you get the buy-in from everybody? That's the most challenging part today in any DEI strategy. Certainly a lot in store as we think about uh, developing these tools, methodologies, frameworks to doing just that, uh, developing a culture of awareness um, and doing so in a way that really involves everyone uh, within the organization. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Pai Olela, for being here today, for taking us through here the content and getting those questions answered. Um, had us in the, in the question box, uh, what's the next launch of this program? Uh, that is a great one for your uh, program advisor. They'll put you on the roster and as soon as we release the next date, you'll be the first to know. As so if you're not quite ready to join, but you want to join a future iteration of the program, there's opportunity for you there as well. As so I do get connected there with an advisor. If you haven't done so already, pick up that link there in the chat. Um, but for now, we're going to go ahead and sign off for today's session. We've reached the top of the hour. Um, any closing remarks you'd like to leave us with here today, uh, Professor pa pa Paolella? Uh, thank you so much, Mary. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you so much for all the participants who, who showed up. Again, we designed this program as much uh, we designed this program for you as much as for the others who won't sign up. So that's your role to assimilate all this knowledge, to try to implement that in your capstone project, in your comprehensive DI strategy, to become an ambassador, to really get the buy-in of all the colleagues and employees within your firm. That's the key message and that the key tools and framework that we're going to see to really increase and foster this um, this buy-in from your colleagues. Uh, thank you again uh, for being here. A lot of uh, exciting uh, uh, thoughts uh, in store here for us as we think about the explorations in this program. Uh, to all of you who've joined us together, it's been an absolute honor and pleasure uh, learning shoulder to shoulder with each and every one of you. And we certainly uh, hope to see you back in the program uh, beginning just around the corner. Uh, thank you again, Professor Paolella, for being here with us today. Uh, but for now, we are going to close out the session with a heartfelt uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good day to all of you from around the globe. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.